Chapter Five of Pariah Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. It seemed that the smell of hunger was in the air. The armed men were cadaverous. Lights came on, and stark horse shadows lay black upon the ground. Calhoun's captors were uniformed, but the uniforms hung loosely upon them. Where the light struck upon their faces, their cheeks were hollow. They were emaciated. And there were the splotches of pigment of which Calhoun had heard. The leader of the truculent group was blue except for two fingers, which in the glaring illumination seemed whiter than white. Out, said the man savagely. We're taking over your stock of food. You'll get your share of it like everybody else, but out. Merrill spoke over Calhoun's shoulder. She uttered a cryptic sentence or two. It should have amounted to identification, but there was skepticism in the armed party. "'Oh, you're one of us, eh?' said the guard leader sardonically. "'You'll have a chance to prove that. Come out of there.' Calhoun spoke abruptly. "'This is a med ship,' he said. "'There are medicines and bacterial cultures inside it. They shouldn't be meddled with. Here on Dara you've had enough of plagues.' The man with the blue hand said as sardonically as before, I said the government was taking over your ship. It won't be looted, but you're not taking a full cargo of food away. In fact, it's not likely you're leaving. I want to speak to someone in authority, snapped Calhoun. We've just come from Weald. He felt bristling hatred all about him as he named Weald. There's tumult there. They're talking about dropping fusion bombs here. It's important that I talk to somebody with the authority to take a few sensible precautions. He descended to the ground. There was a panicky chee-chee from behind him, and Murgatroyd came dashing to swarm up his body and cling apprehensively to his neck. What's that? A turmoil, said Calhoun. He's not a pet. Your medical men will know something about him. This is a med ship, and I'm a med ship man and he's an important member of the crew. He's a medship turmoil, and he stays with me." The man with the blue hand said harshly, "'There's somebody waiting to ask you questions. Here.' A ground car came rolling out from the side of the landing grid enclosure. The ground car ran on wheels, and wheels were not much used on modern worlds. Dara was behind the times in more ways than one. This car will take you to defense, and you can tell him anything you want. But don't try to sneak back in this ship. It'll be guarded. The ground car was enclosed with room for a driver and the three from the med ship. But armed men festooned themselves about its exterior, and it went bumping and rolling to the massive ground layer girders of the grid. It rolled out under them, and there was paved highway. It picked up speed. There were buildings on either side of the road, but few showed lights. This was nighttime, and the men at the landing grid had set a pattern of hunger, so that the silence and the dark buildings did not seem a sign of tranquility and sleep, but of exhaustion and despair. The highway lamps were few by comparison with other inhabited worlds and the ground car needed lights of its own to guide its driver over a paved surface that needed repair. By those moving lights other depressing things could be seen. Untidiness, buildings not kept up to perfection, evidence of apathy. The road hadn't been clean lately. There was litter here and there. Even the fact that there were no stars added to the feeling of wretchedness and gloom and, ultimately, of hunger. Merrill spoke nervously to the driver. The famine isn't any better. He moved his head in negation, but did not speak. I left two years ago, said Merrill. It was just beginning then. Rationing hadn't started then. The driver said evenly, There's rationing now. The car went on and on. A vast open space appeared ahead. Lights about its perimeter seemed few and pale. Everything seems worse, even the lights. Using all the power, said the driver, to warm up ground, to grow crops where it ought to be winter. Not doing too well, either. 
Calhoun knew somehow that Marl moistened her lips. I was sent, she explained to the driver, to go ashore on Trent and then make my way to Weald. I mail reports of what I found out back to Trent. Somebody got them back to here whenever it was possible. The driver said, Everybody knows the man on Trent disappeared. Maybe he got caught. Maybe somebody saw him without makeup, or maybe he just quit being one of us. What's the difference? No use. Calhoun found himself wincing a little. The driver was not angry. He was hopeless. But men should not despair. They shouldn't accept hostility from those about them as a device of fate for their destruction. They shouldn't— Merrill said quickly to him, You understand? Dara's a heavy metals planet. There aren't many light elements in our soil. Potassium is scarce. So our ground isn't very fertile. Before the plague, we traded heavy metals and manufactures for imports of food and potash. But since the plague, we've had no off-planet commerce. We've been quarantined. I gathered as much, said Calhoun. It was up to the Med Service to see that that didn't happen. It's up to the Med Service now to see that it stops. Too late now for anything, said the driver. Whatever Med Service may be, they're talking about cutting down our population so there'll be food enough for some to live. There's two questions about it. Who's to be kept alive and why? The ground car aimed now for a cluster of faintly brighter lights on the far side of the great open space. They enlarged as they grew nearer. Merrill said hesitantly, There was someone, Carvin, Calhoun didn't catch the rest of the name, he was working on food plants. I thought he might accomplish something. The driver said caustically, Sure, everybody's heard about him. He came up with a wonderful thing. He and his outfit worked out a way to process weeds so they can be eaten. And they can. You can fill your belly and not feel hungry. It's like eating hay. You starve just the same. He's still working, head of a government division. Ground car passed through a gate. It stopped before a lighted door. The armed men hanging to its outside dropped off. They watched Calhoun closely as he stepped out with Murgatroyd riding on his shoulder. Minutes later they faced a hastily summoned group of officials of the Darian government. For a ship to land on Dara was so remarkable an event that it called practically for a cabinet meeting, and Calhoun noted that they were no better fed than the guards at the spaceport. They regarded Calhoun and Merrill with oddly burning eyes. It was, of course, because the two of them showed no signs of hunger. They obviously had not been on short rations. "'My name is Calhoun,' said Calhoun briskly. "'I've the usual med service credentials. Now—' He did not wait to be questioned. He told them of the appalling state of things in the twelfth sector of the med service, so that men had been borrowed from other sectors to remedy the intolerable, and he was one of them. He told of his arrival at Weald and what had happened there, from the excessively cautious insistence that he proved he was not a Darian, to the arrival of the death ship from Oridi. He was giving them the news affecting them as they had not heard it before. He went on to tell of his stop at Oridi and his purpose, and his encounter with the men he found there. When he finished, there was silence. He broke it. Now, he said, Marl's an agent of yours. She can add to what I've told you. I'm Med Service. I have a job to do here to repair what wasn't done before. I should make a planetary health inspection and make recommendations for the improvement of this state of things. I'll be glad if you'll arrange for me to talk to your health officials. Things look bad and something should be done. Someone laughed without mirth. What will you recommend for long-continued undernourishment? he asked derisively. That's our health problem. I recommend food, said Calhoun. Where'll you fill the prescription? I've the answer to that, too, said Calhoun curtly. I'll want to talk to any space pilots you've got. 
Get your astrogators together, and I think they'll approve my idea. The silence was totally skeptical. Oridi, not Oridi, said Calhoun. We all will be hunting that planet over for Darians. If they find any, they'll drop bombs here. Our only space pilots, said a tall man presently, are on Oridi now. If you told the truth, they'll probably head back because of your warning. They should bring meat. His mouth worked peculiarly, and Calhoun knew that it was at the thought of food. Which, said another man sharply, goes to the hospitals. I haven't tasted meat in two years. Nobody has, growled another man still. Here's this man Calhoun. I'm not convinced he can work magic, but we can find out if he lies. Put a guard on his ship. Otherwise, let our health men give him his head. They'll find out if he's from this medical service he tells of. And this Merrill, I can be identified, said Merrill. I was sent to gather information, and sent it in secret writing to one of us on Trent. I have a family here. They'll know me. And I, there was someone who was working on foods, and I believe he made it possible to use uh, all sorts of vegetation for food. He will identify me. Someone laughed harshly. Ha, oh, yes, said a man with a blue forehead. He's a valuable man. Within the year he's come up with a way to make his weeds taste like any food one chooses. If we decide to cut our population, we'll simply give the people to be eliminated all they want to eat of his products. They'll not be hungry. They'll be quite happy. But they'll die for lack of nourishment. He's volunteered to prove it painless by going through it himself. Merrill swallowed. I'd like to see him, she repeated, and my family. Some of the blue splotched men turned away. A broad-shouldered man said bluntly, Don't look for them to be glad to see you, and you'd better not show yourself in public. You've been well fed. You'll be hated for that. Merrill began to cry. Burgatroy said bewilderedly, Chee? Chee? Calhoun held him close. There was confusion, and Calhoun found the Minister of Health at hand. He looked most harried of all the officials gathered to question Calhoun, and proposed that he get a look at the hospital situation right away. It wasn't practical. With all the population on half rations or less, when night came people needed to sleep. Most people indeed slept as many hours out of the traditional twenty-four as they could manage. It was much more pleasant to sleep than to be awake and constantly nagged at by continued hunger. And there was the matter of simple decency. Continuous gnawing hunger had an embittering effect upon everyone. Quarrelsomeness was a common experience, and people who would normally be the leaders of opinion felt shame because they were obsessed by thoughts of food. It was best when people slept. Still, Calhoun was in the hospitals by daybreak. What he found moved him to savage anger. There were too many sick children. In every case, undernourishment contributed to their sickness. And there was not enough food to make them well. Doctors and nurses denied themselves food to spare it for their patients. Calhoun brought out hormones and enzymes and medications from the med ship, while the guard in the ship looked on, he demonstrated the processes of synthesis and autocatalyst that enabled such small samples to be multiplied indefinitely. He was annoyed by a clamorous appetite. There were some doctors who ignored the irony of medical techniques being taught to cure non-nutritional disease when everybody was half-fed or less. They approved of Calhoun. They even approved of Murgatroyd when Calhoun explained his function. He was, of course, a med service tarmel, and tarmels were creatures of talent. They'd originally been found on a planet in the Deneb area, and they were engaging and friendly small animals. But the remarkable fact about them was that they couldn't contract any disease. Not any. They had a built-in explosive reaction to bacterial and viral toxins, 
and there hadn't yet been any pathogenetic organism discovered to which a tarmal could not more or less immediately develop antibody resistance. So that, in interstellar medicine, tarmals were priceless. Let Murgatroyd be infected with however localized, however specialized an inimical organism, and presently some highly valuable defensive substance could be isolated from his blood, and he'd remain in his usual exuberant good health. When the antibody was analyzed by those techniques of microanalysis the service had developed, why, that was that. The antibody could be synthesized, and one could attack any epidemic with confidence. The tragedy for Dara, of course, was that no medship had come there three generations ago when the Dara plague raged. Worse, after the plague, Weald was able to exert pressure which only a criminally incompetent med service director would have permitted. But criminal incompetence and its consequences was what Calhoun had been loaned to Sector Twelve to help remedy. He was not at ease, though. No ship arrived from Aridi to bear out his account of an attempt to get that lonely world evacuated before Weald discovered it had blueskins on it. Merrill had vanished to visit or return to her family, or perhaps to consult with the mysterious Corvan, who'd arranged for her to leave Dara to be a spy, and had advised her simply to make a new life somewhere else, abandoning a famine-ridden, despised, and outcast world. Calhoun had learned of two achievements the same Carvan had made for his world. Neither was remarkably constructive. He'd offered to prove the value of the second by dying of it, which might make him a very admirable character, or he could have a passion for martyrdom, which is much more common than most people think. In two days Calhoun was irritable enough from unaccustomed hunger to suspect the worst of him. And there was Weald to worry about. Weald was hysterically resolved to end what it considered the blue-skin menace for once and for all. There were parallels to such unreasoning frenzy even in the ancient history of Earth. A word still remained in the dictionaries referring to it, genocide. Meanwhile Calhoun worked doggedly in the hospitals while the patients were awake, and in the med ship, under guard, afterward. He had hunger cramps now, but he tested a plastic cube with a thriving biological culture in it. He worked at increasing his store of it. He'd snipped samples of pigmented skin from dead patients in the hospitals, and examined the pigmented areas, and very, very painstakingly verified a theory. It took an electron microscope to do it, but he found a virus in the blue patches which matched the type discovered on Tralee. The Tralee viruses had effects which were passed on from mother to child, and heredity had been charged with the observed results of quasi-living viral particles, and then Calhoun very, very carefully introduced into a virus culture the material he had been growing in a plastic cube. He watched what happened. He was satisfied, so much so, that immediately afterward he barely managed to stagger off to bed. That night the ship from Aridi came in, packed with frozen, bloody carcasses of cattle. Calhoun knew nothing of it. Next morning Marl came back. There were shadows under her eyes, and her expression was of someone who had lost everything that had meaning in her life. I'm all right, she insisted when Calhoun commented. I've been visiting my family. I've seen Carvan. I'm quite all right. You haven't eaten any better than I have, Calhoun observed. I couldn't, admitted Merrill. My sisters, my little sisters, so thin. There's rationing for everybody, and it's all efficiently arranged. They even had rations for me, but I couldn't eat. I gave most of my food to my sisters, and they squabbled over it. Calhoun said nothing. There was nothing to say. Then she said, in a no less desolate tone, Carvan said I was foolish to come back. He could be right, said Calhoun. But I had to, protested Merrill, because I—I've been eating all I wanted to, on Weald and in the ship, 
and I'm ashamed because they're half-starved and I'm not. And when you see what hunger does to them, it's terrible to be half-starved and not able to think of anything but food. I hope, said Calhoun, to do something about that, if I can get hold of an astrogator or two. The ship that was on Oridi came in during the night, Merrill told him shakily. It was loaded with frozen meat, but one ship loads not enough to make a difference on the whole planet. And if we all hunts for us on Oridi, we daren't go back for more meat. She said abruptly, There are some prisoners. They were miners. They were crowded out of the ship. The Darians who'd stampeded the cattle took them prisoners. They had to. True, said Calhoun. It wouldn't have been wise to leave Rialdians around on Oridi with their throats cut, or living either to tell about a rumor of blueskins, even if their throats will be cut now. Is that the program? Merrill shivered. No, they'll be put on short rations like everybody else, and people will watch them. The Rialdians expect to die of plague any minute because they've been with Darians, so people look at them and laugh, but it's not funny. It's natural, said Calhoun, but perhaps lacking in charity. Look here, how about those astrogators? I need them for a job I have in mind. Merrill wrung her hands. Come here, she said in a low tone. There was an armed guard in the control room of the ship. He'd watched Calhoun a good part of the previous day, as Calhoun performed his mysterious work. He'd been off duty and now was on duty again. He was bored. So long as Calhoun did not touch the control board, though, he was uninterested. He didn't even turn his head when Merrill led the way into the other cabin and slid the door shut. The astrogators are coming, she said swiftly. They'll bring some boxes with them. They'll ask you to instruct them so that they can handle our ship better. They lost themselves coming back from Aridi. No, they didn't lose themselves, but they lost time. Enough time, almost, to make an extra trip for meat. They need to be experts. I'm to come along, so they can be sure that what you teach them is what you've been doing right along." Calhoun said, Well? They're crazy, said Merrill vehemently. They knew Weald would do something monstrous sooner or later. But they're going to try to stop it by more monstrousness sooner. Not everybody agrees, but there are enough. So they want to use your ship, it's faster in overdrive and so on, and they'll go to Weald in this ship, and uh, they say they'll give Weald something to keep it busy without bothering us." Calhoun said dryly, "'This pays me off for not being too sympathetic with blueskins. But if I'd been hungry for a couple of years and was despised to boot by the people who kept me hungry, I suppose I might react the same way. No, he said curtly, as she opened her lips to speak again. Don't tell me the trick. Considering everything, there's only one trick it could be, but I doubt profoundly that it would work. All right. He slid the door back and returned to the control room. Merrill followed him. He said detachedly, I've been working on a problem outside of the food one. It isn't the time to talk about it right now, but I think I've solved it. Merrill turned her head, listening. There were footsteps on the tarmac outside the ship. Both doors of the airlock were open. Four men came in. They were young men, who did not look quite as hungry as most Darians. But there was a reason for that. Their leader introduced himself and the others. They were the astrogators of the ship Dara had built to try to bring food from Aridi. They were not good enough, said their self-appointed leader. They overshot their destination. They came out of overdrive too far offline. They needed instructions. Calhoun nodded and observed that he'd been asking for them. We've got orders, said their leader steadily, to come on board and learn from you how to handle this ship. It's better than the one we've got. I asked for you, repeated Calhoun. I have an idea I'll explain as we go along. Those boxes? Someone was passing in iron boxes through the airlock. One of the four very carefully brought them inside. Their rations, said a second young man. We don't go anywhere without rations, except O'Reedy. O'Reedy, yes. I think we were shooting at each other there, said Calhoun presently, weren't we? 
Yes, said the young man. He was neither cordial nor antagonistic. He was impassive. Calhoun shrugged. Then we can take off immediately. Here's the communicator, and there's the button. You might call the grid and arrange for us to be lifted. The young man seated himself at the control board. Very professionally he went through the routine of preparing to lift by landing grid, which routine has not changed in two hundred years. He went briskly ahead until the order to lift. Then Calhoun stopped him. Hold it. He pointed to the airlock. Both doors were open. The young man at the control board flushed vividly. One of the others closed and dogged the doors. The ship lifted. Calhoun watched with seeming negligence, but he found occasion for a dozen corrections of procedure. This was presumably a training voyage of his own suggestion. Therefore, when the blue-skinned pilot would have flung the bad ship into undirected overdrive, Calhoun grew stern. He insisted on a destination. He suggested Weald. The young men glanced at each other and accepted the suggestion. He made the acting pilot look up the intrinsic business of its sun and measure its apparent brightness from just off Dara. He made him estimate the change in brightness to be expected after so many hours in overdrive if one broke out to measure. The first blue-skinned student pilot ended a Calhoun determined tour of duty with rather more of respect for Calhoun than he'd had at the beginning. The second was anxious to show up better than the first. Calhoun drilled him in the use of the brightness charts, by which the changes in apparent brightness of stars between overdrive hops could be correlated with angular changes to give a three-dimensional picture of the nearer heavens. It was a highly necessary art which had not been worked out on Dara, and the prospective astrogators became absorbed in this and other fine points of space piloting. They'd done enough in a few trips to Oridi to realize that they needed to know more. Calhoun showed them. Calhoun did not try to make things easy for them. He was hungry and easily annoyed. It was sound training tactics to be severe and to phrase all suggestions as commands. He put the four young men in command of the ship in turn under his direction. He continued to use Weald as a destination, but he set up problems in which the med ship came out of overdrive pointing in an unknown direction and with a precessory motion. He made the third of his students identify Weald in the celestial globe containing hundreds of millions of stars, and get on course and overdrive toward it. The fourth was suddenly required to compute the distance to Weald from such data as he could get from observation without reference to any records. By this time the first man was chafing to take a second turn. Calhoun gave each of them a second grueling lesson. He gave them, in fact, a highly condensed but very sound course in the art of travel in space. His young students took command in four-hour watches with at least one breakout from overdrive in each watch. He built up enthusiasm in them. They ignored the discomfort of being hungry, though there had been no reason for them to stint on food in Oridi, in growing pride in what they came to know. When Weald was a first magnitude star, the four were not highly qualified astrogators to be sure, but they were vastly better spacemen than at the beginning. Inevitably, their attitude toward Calhoun was respectful. He'd been irritable and right. To the young, the combination is impressive. Merrill had served as passenger only. In theory, she was to compare Calhoun's lessons with his practice when alone, but he did nothing on this journey which, teaching considered, was different from the two interstellar journeys Merrill had made with him. She occupied the sleeping cabin during two of the six watches of each ship day. She operated the food readier, which was almost completely emptied of its original store of food, confiscated by the government of Dara. That amount of food would make no difference to the planet, but it was wise for everyone on Dara to be equally ill-fed. On the sixth day out from Dara, the son of Weald had a magnitude of minus five-tenths. 
The electron telescope could detect its larger planets, especially a gas giant fifth orbit world of high albedo. Calhoun had his four students estimate its distance again, pointing out the difference that could be made in breakout position if the med ship were misaimed by as much as one second of arc. That does it, Calhoun announced cheerfully. That's the last order I'll give you. Your graduate pilots from here on, relax and have some coffee. And now, said Calhoun, I suppose you'll tell me the truth about those boxes you brought on board. You said they were rations, but they haven't been opened in six days. I have an idea what they mean, but you tell me. The four looked uncomfortable. There was a long pause. They could be, said Calhoun detachedly, cultures to be dumped on Weald. Weald is making plans to wipe out Dara, so some fool has decided to get Weald too busy fighting a plague of its own to bother with you. Is that right?" The young men stirred uneasily. "'Well, sir,' said one of them unhappily, "'that's what we were ordered to do.' "'I object,' said Calhoun. "'It wouldn't work. I just left we all the little while back, remember. They've been telling themselves that some day Dara would try that. They've made preparations to fight any imaginable contagion you could drop on them. Every so often somebody claims it's happening. It wouldn't work. But, in fact, said Calhoun, I will not permit you to do anything of the kind. One of the young men, staring at Calhoun, nodded suddenly. His eyes closed. He jerked his head erect and looked bewildered. A second sank heavily into a chair. He said remotely, Shfai, and abruptly went to sleep. The third found his knees giving away. He paid elaborate attention to them, stiffening them, but they yielded like rubber and he went slowly down to the floor. The fourth said thickly with difficulty, yet reproachfully, but you're our friend." He collapsed. Calhoun very soberly tied them hand and foot and laid them out comfortably on the floor. Merrill watched, white-faced, her hand to her throat. "'What have you done to them? Are they dead?' "'No,' said Calhoun, just shrugged. They'll wake up presently." Merrill said in a tense and desperate whisper, "'You're betraying us.' You're going to take us to Weald. No, said Calhoun. We'll only orbit around it. First, though, I want to get rid of those damned packed-up cultures. They're dead, by the way. I killed them with supersonics a few days ago, while a fine argument was going on about distance measurements by veritable cephets of known period. He put the four boxes carefully in the waste disposal unit. He operated it. The boxes and their contents streamed out to space in the form of metallic and other vapors. Calhoun sat at the control desk. I'm a med service man, he said detachedly. I couldn't cooperate in the spread of plague, anyhow, though a useful epidemic might be another matter. But the important thing right now is not keeping we all busy with troubles to increase their hatred of Dara. It's getting some food for Dara and driblets won't help. What's needed is in thousands of tons, or tens of thousands." Then he said, "'Overdrive coming, Murgatroyd, hold fast!' The universe vanished. The customary unpleasant sensations accompanied the change. Murgatroyd burped. End of chapter 5